If you're the goddess of warfare and aggression in Mesopotamia, how do you make sure that people don't see you as a little bit too butch? Well, by being the most overtly erotic, sensual person you can possibly be. In this video, we will be focusing on the goddess Inanna, specifically how she's depicted in poetry written during the Sargonic period, and her dual roles as goddess of love and warfare. Like, subscribe, come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Sex and Eroticism in Mesopotamian Literature. This is episode 12, Women are from Venus, also femininity, eroticism, and the goddess Inanna. In this video, we'll be looking briefly at the male and female experiences as seen so far in Sumerian literature. We'll be finding out a little bit more about the goddess Inanna, and then looking closely at the character of Inanna as revealed in poetry, and finally, we'll have our brief summary. So male and female experiences. As we've seen so far in the literary texts that we've looked at, male sexuality is very much concerned with phallic displays and the impregnation of female deities by male gods. This is taken by like to be the way in which male gods express their virility and their masculinity, um, and is linked to the importance of men in the reproductive process. There's very little in these texts to do with love or emotions. They're primarily preoccupied with physical copulation and the creation of babies. Female participants, because of that, are mainly seen as receptacles for the fertilizing semen. They don't say much, they don't do an awful lot. And like suggests that this is possibly because marriage and sexual relations may have been seen as more of a private thing. And she suggests that in many societies, private life is dominated by the women, whereas public life is primarily the concern of men. So you don't get in these literary texts much expression of sexuality, erotic sexuality, um, and marriage and relationship and emotions because she argues this was primarily the domain of women so if you have a text that is concerned first and foremost with men you're simply not going to get that kind of expression. Because, like argues, love literature is generally set inside the home it falls within this private sphere and therefore the purview of women and goddesses. Because of that, in this love literature, you get much more of a sexual overtone, much more eroticism, and also more emphasis on emotions and the women's role in these kinds of relationships. The women's voice dominates in the text, and she speaks of desire, the gratification of her sexual pleas, and like views any male voices here as an imagined response to the goddess's requests. The main figure in this love literature is the goddess Inanna. Uh, she's one of the more famous Mesopotamian deities. You'll probably know her as the goddess of love and war. Um, and her warlike characteristics become very, very important in the Old Akkadian or Sargonic period, which starts in roughly 2333 BCE. By the later Isinlasa period, which starts around 2004 BCE, her figure is much, much more complex, but even in the Sargonic period, she was still invoked in love incantations. She's not purely a martial deity, but this aspect of her as a goddess of love, goddess of marriage, is, is much more fully rounded as we go through history. She's the patron deity of eroticism, sensuality, also adultery, brides, prostitutes, transvestites, a whole bunch of stuff. And she becomes, in Mesopotamian literature, kind of like the preeminent archetypal female figure among the gods. And often there's a, a division seen in the literature between fertility and sexuality, as we've, we've already looked at. Fertility seems to have been more the role of the male participant, and sensuality is, is more geared towards women. Um, but this is not entirely clear-cut uh, in the figure of the goddess Inanna, because while she's primarily concerned with eroticism, sexuality, and sexual pleasure, she is still sometimes invoked to assist in childbirth, um, and she bears this role in the myth concerning the, the king Etana, 
who uh, goes on a journey to find the plant of birth to help his wife conceive. And Inanna is the goddess that holds that plant. It's not in the uh, possession of one of the male gods. So, Inanna in poetry. Some of the most famous poetry concerning the goddess Inanna is attributed to a woman called Enheduanna. Uh, whether she wrote it or not is another matter entirely, but it's attributed to her, so we're going to go with that for now. Uh, she was a princess, um, daughter of King Sargon during the Sarconic or Old Akkadian period, and she was also a priestess. She was the priestess of the moon god Nana, who is coincidentally also often seen as the father of Inanna, and she seems to have been a personal devotee of Inanna. So her official role was high priestess of the moon god, but it, it seems like she personally felt more of an affinity for his daughter. One of the uh, most well-known poems that Enheduanna wrote is known as the Exaltation of Inanna or Inanna B. Uh, Assyriologists are really imaginative when it comes to naming things. Uh, we name hymns using things like Inanna B, Inanna C, Idindagan A. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. So in the Exaltation of Inanna, Inanna is depicted as possessing the maze. If you've listened to some of our other videos, you may have an idea of what the maze are already. Uh, they're often called the Divine Ordinances. Um, they're things like agriculture and basket making and weaving, uh, but also warfare, violence, um, adultery, marriage, whole host of experiences common to uh, being human. So she's seen here as being in possession of the maze, so she's kind of like the guardian of civilization. She owns everything that is needed for civilized life. And the poem also greatly emphasizes her destructive nature. As I mentioned earlier, the, the martial aspect of Inanna is very important during this period, so we might expect that compositions written during this time focus on her aggression. Um, so we have a, an extract here. Lady of all the divine powers, resplendent light, righteous woman clothed in radiance, beloved of Arn and Urash, mistress of heaven with the great diadem, who loves the good headdress befitting the office of N priestess, who has seized all seven of its divine powers. My lady, you are the guardian of the great divine powers. You have taken up the divine powers. You have hung the divine powers from your hand. You have gathered up the divine powers. You have clasped the divine powers to your breast. Like a dragon, you have deposited venom on the lands. When, like Ishkor, you roar at the earth, no vegetation can stand up to you. As a flood descending upon those foreign lands, powerful one of heaven and earth, you are their Inanna. So here we see both her possession of the maze, the divine powers, but also her um, attributes of being like a dragon, like a flood, very destructive, violent forces being associated with the goddess here. At the end of the text, she's also described as a beautiful woman, which is much more in keeping with her role in other compositions associated primarily with sensuality and eroticism. So the lines read, The powerful lady, respected in the gathering of rulers, has accepted her offerings from her. Inanna's holy heart has been assuaged. The light was sweet for her, delight extended over her. She was full of fairest beauty. Like the light of the rising moon, she exuded delight. Nana came out to gaze at her properly, and her mother Ningal blessed her. The doorposts greeted her. Everyone's speech to the mistress is exalted. Praise be to the destroyer of foreign lands, endowed with divine powers by An, to my lady enveloped in beauty, to Inanna. So here, right at the very end, we see kind of this trifecta of um, characteristics. She's not only the destroyer of foreign lands, she's also the person who possesses the divine powers, and an absolutely beautiful woman. The second poem we're going to consider is a hymn to Inanna, known as Inanna C. Like I said, we're great at naming things in my field. And again, this one, still written by N. Heijuana, emphasizes the goddess's destructive nature. Like suggests that in this myth, she appears to be competing with the god Enlil for a place in the hierarchy. So her masculine qualities are emphasized here to make her a fitting replacement for the god. Here the composition lists her various spheres of interest, and they cover almost all aspects of human existence, which is very similar to a list of her attributes in the myth Inanna's Descent. To open up roads and paths, a place of peace for the journey, a companion for the weak, are yours, Inanna. 
to keep paths and ways in good order, to shatter earth and to make it firm are yours, Inanna. To destroy, to build up, to tear out and to settle are yours, Inanna. To turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man are yours, Inanna. Desirability and arousal, bringing goods into existence and establishing properties and equipment are yours, Inanna. Profit, gain, great wealth and greater wealth are yours, Inanna. Profit and having success in wealth, financial loss and reduced wealth are yours, Inanna. So this is just an extract from the text, but what we see is that Inanna is concerned with both positive and negative attributes. She keeps paths and ways in good order, but she also shatters the earth at the same time, so she can create and destroy with one hand. We have to destroy, to build out, to tear out, and to settle. She's really a goddess concerned with, or at least is depicted here as a goddess concerned with all aspects of life, um, which makes her very important and very powerful. So several of these spheres of interest are also connected to women and sexuality. And here we have to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man, desirability and arousal, to have a favourite wife, to love, and to create a woman's chamber. So while we have all that destructive language and aggressive tendencies, she's also very concerned with gender, sexuality, desire and eroticism. So in summary, Inanna is strongly linked with violence and warfare, particularly in the Sargonic period, but despite that, even when her aggression is being emphasised, she still has this uh, erotic, sensual, beautiful overtone. Like argues that this link to uh, martial tendencies is, is connected to her high social status. Like suggests that the martial aspect of the goddess is very masculine, and she attributes the importance of men in reproduction to their heightened social status. So as Inanna is acting here like a man, she must also have this superior social status. And finally, Inanna's theological construction is as contradictory as that of Enlil. We saw a couple of videos ago that Enlil is a male deity who absorbs feminine elements, goddess Namu, the sea goddess Tiamat, and then, like argues, compensates by becoming the most masculine, the most phallic of all the gods. In contrast, Inanna is very strongly concerned with here male aspects of warfare and celestial rulership, so she kind of compensates by being overtly erotic, sensual and feminine. I will argue that characterising these things as particularly gendered is a very modern reading. It does appear from what we've seen to be borne out in the texts as well, but these gender stereotypes should be questioned. I wouldn't accept these without considering how much of our, our modern understanding of gender is being read back into the ancient texts. So next time we're going to take another look at Inanna, this time focusing on the bridal songs. And remember, until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? <laughs>